Welcome to Countryside Christian Church here in Mission, Kansas. For those of you who are worshiping online and those here present today, we greet you and welcome you to a time of worship and reflection and refreshment. Put your mind and heart at ease now as we listen to the prelude and let it lead us into time with God. So come, Christians, join and sing. Join me in the call to worship. Lent is a coming home. Home to calm our fears. Lent is a coming home. Home to a warm embrace. Home to God's own heart. Let us continue by singing. Please stand and sing, O Worship the King. Number 17, verses 1, 2, and 5.
remained standing for our prayer. I'm in a, a group with other clergy who are studying the lectionary, and one was wondering how to address the prayers for this morning. And I had it here. It's the second verse. Okay, Roger. There it is. It's the second verse of um, Lead on, O King Eternal. And so close your eyes, and as a prayer, listen to this, and then we'll lead into the Lord's Prayer. Lead on, O King Eternal, till sin's fierce war shall cease, and holiness shall whisper the sweet amen of peace. Fear not with swords loud clashing or roll of stirring drums. With deeds of love and mercy, your heavenly kingdom comes. We pray that it will, O Lord, and hear us as we pray the, song, the prayer you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Those who are young in age, young in spirit, or young in heart, come on down. So if I wanted to see something that was way far off, what's the best thing to use? <laughs> Not glasses. No? Well, yeah, that. But what else? Binoculars, right? I meant to bring my binoculars with me so you could look up and see Bob better than you can see him down here. But uh, I forgot my binoculars. But how far away from us is God? So if, if we wanted to see God, where would we look? Let me, let me re what? say that again. Okay, that's a good place because that's where God resides. But do you think that there is a possibility that you could look out here and pick somebody that you might be able to see God through them? Yeah, how is that? If, if God is up in heaven, how could I look out here and see, for example, Joan, and say that I know for sure I can see God in her. Why is that? Because what? Say that again. Because God is with us. God is with us always. And not only that, I know that Joan really worked hard to prepare a funeral dinner and a First Friday dinner, along with a lot of other help out of other people Paul, too, you know, so all of those people, that if we are doing God's will, if you listen to my closing prayer every Sunday, I always say, help us to live our lives so that others can see you through us. So, as Christians, that becomes our job, to let other people see God in and through us. So, this week, my challenge to you is, live your lives that way so other people can see God through you. You guys have a great week.
We have quite a few items for the community time today. First of all, Disciples Women would like to thank everyone who helped with the bake sale last Sunday. I received a generous donation Saturday evening and raised over $1,500 on Sunday at the sale. This will provide educational support to our applicants for the next school year. The Kansas City Regional Evening Disciples Women Group, the dinner meeting will be Thursday, April 28th. It'll be 6 p.m. registration, 6.30 dinner, $6. It's all about sixes. Red <laughs> Reservation is due by Monday, 425 and um, there'll be information as to who can who you can contact i forgot where it is uh, overland park. Park. park i did know that that's nice and close the resound, resound handbell um, choir is having a concert at Merriam christian church on Saturday of this coming week at 7 p.m. and they are excellent. <clears throat> Here's another one for the regional evening, evening meeting. Uh, it is the same thing, good. It's nicer than my handwritten piece of paper. And then life in the community recently, um, of course, we had Jerry Connor's funeral and a dinner Friday. And thanks to all who helped with the service and the lunch that followed. First Friday was a success. Good to see friends and faces that we had missed over time. Okay, funeral here yesterday for Dayton Coke. Cook, Coke. Upcoming weeks, Disciples Women will be this coming Thursday, the 7th. Is that this coming Thursday? I lost track of time. At 10 a.m., watch for an email tomorrow from Trudy. Next Sunday is Palm Sunday. Can you believe that? My favorite Sunday, just put a tick there. When I was in Indiana, I had 95 kids under 18. So you can imagine Palm Sunday with 95 kids at church. We won't have 95 kids, but we will be doing our choir cantata, and you won't want to miss that. It's a wonderful thematic um, cantata that weaves us through those last days. Monday, Thursday service, April 14th at 7. And I believe that concludes the announcements I have. Hey, Barb? Yes. We have one more announcement. We have two folks in the north that actually have a little bit I invite you to sing our prayer songs together. It is well with my soul.
As we come to our prayer time this morning, uh, like Margot said, there are two prayer quilts out there. Uh, the first one for Paul, um, he did take a pretty good fall the other day, uh, but uh, nothing too serious with that. Uh, but he is, uh, of course, uh, there's that spot on his lung that they are beginning treatment on. So please stop and sign, I mean not sign, I guess you could sign it if you wanted to, but tie a knot in something in the little strings on the, the uh, quilt there for Paul. And for Barb, um, you know, last Sunday we were blessed to be able to be part of the service that uh, made her a retired regional minister emeritus. And so that quilt is in honor for that. So please say a prayer for her and tie a knot in that quilt as well. Um, some of you who were at First Friday probably knew that uh, there was a lady that took a fall down the steps over here. She missed the bottom step uh, going down to that first landing and fell. And her name was Norma McCall. Um, Against her wishes, we called an ambulance and they came and took her to the hospital at Advent. I think that's right, at Advent, yeah. Um, she ended up having a cracked hip, but sometimes things happen that is for the better, okay? After they got her to the hospital and admitted her and decided that she had that crack in her hip, her blood pressure was elevated, and they got to checking into it, and they think that there's a possibility there's a blood clot, not from the fall, but from something else. Uh, so they're concerned about her blood pressure, um, and so maybe it was a good thing, you know, that, uh, and she is just a little over 90. Where's Leona? On the, on the 13th of, and yeah. And she also uh, just lost her husband about six months ago. Oh, wow. And she's been really struggling with that. Yeah. Um, so anyway, if you could, and there are several things there, so you can pray for her in the grieving process yeah. and for whatever they find out. She has a history of PIA. Yeah. And she has a heart condition. So uh, there's lots, lots to be dealt with. Yeah. And uh, so, anyway, I think she probably is where she needs to be in the hospital so they can help get things straightened out for her. So for Miss Norma, Lord in your mercy. Your um, Dennis Morche is gonna be going into the hospital at Advent tomorrow morning at seven o'clock for back surgery. Uh, I think Tiffany said that his surgery was originally scheduled for like one o'clock in the afternoon. And luckily, somebody canceled and his surgery got moved to seven, so uh, to seven in the morning. So that's a really good thing. So for the surgeons as they work and for a quick recovery for Dennis, Lord in your mercy. Yeah. Um, LaBella, I'm gonna throw something at you. Um, and we had talked about celebrating birthdays just one Sunday. So the first Sunday, this is first Sunday in April. So I do know that there's at least three people here this morning that have birthdays in April. Mike is one. Mike, your birthday is the ninth. The ninth. Nora, your birthday is the ninth too, isn't it? Okay, so Mike and Nora's birthday is the ninth. Chris, oh, Steve, when's your birthday? 27th, okay. What? Seventh, and mine just happens to be the seventh. There's just so many really good people born in April. <laughs> so let's sing happy birthday to all of us April Fools.
God is good. All the time. Join me in prayer. Kind and loving Lord, we thank you for this beautiful morning that you have given us to come and worship you. We thank you so much for your presence here with us as we talked about with our children's time, that you are with us always, that you are just here. And we can see you in other people. And we thank you so much for that. Help each one of us to remember that other people should be able to see you through us as well. We do thank you for that presence with us always. Gracious God, we thank you for this incredible passage of scripture that you have given us where you promise us that you are about to do something new that you will cause rivers to flow in the desert places. Help us to understand that, to see that, as we are almost finished with this journey through Lent. Help us to understand just how important that journey really is. We humbly ask these things now in your son Jesus' name. Amen. You all have been very kind, and I appreciate that so much. As we come to the time of offering, we want to remember that our God is a God of compassion. God knows our faults and yet loves us and forgives us. God keeps us in his presence even when we forget that we are in God's presence. God opens our hearts to gladness. And I invite you to feel that gladness by opening your hearts and your wallets so that we can support this ministry because through this church, through the ministers here, we are nurtured to go out and bring and be God's presence in all of the world and help bring dry bones to dance and to restore the joy of God's salvation everywhere we go. So let us now receive the offering and feel gladness as we do that, that we have this place in our lives. Amen.
Gracious God, we thank you for gifts given this morning from our hearts. Help us, your children, to use these gifts to tell the world about Jesus, the name above all names. Bless both the gift and the giver. In Jesus' holy name, amen.
A reading from the book of Isaiah. Thus says the Lord, who makes a way in the sea, a path in the mighty waters, who brings out chariot and horse, army and warrior. They lie down, they cannot rise. They are extinguished, quenched like a wick. Do not remember the former things or consider the things of old. I am about to do a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. The wild animals will honor me, the jackals and the ostriches. For I give water in the wilderness, rivers in the desert, to give drink to my chosen people, the people whom I formed for myself, so that they might declare my praise. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? Gracious God, may the words of my mouth, the meditations of my heart be holy and acceptable to you. O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. We are almost finished with Lent. Can you believe that there's only two Sundays left? Next Sunday will be our choir special, and it will be Palm Sunday. My, oh my, how time flies when one is having fun. Although Lent may seem to be a season of restrictions and limitations, in fact, it provides us with many opportunities for a fresh start. Each day brings us a new day, a brand new gift from God. So then, how are you doing with your Lenten discipline, or dare I ask that question? You don't have to answer it aloud, believe me. I don't know about you, but for me, I know all too well how easy it is to say that you will do something special for Lent or for New Year's, for example. And we get so excited where we're just ready to go. And no matter what happens, the busyness of life sets in and we skip a day and then another day and then a week. And what's the point? We probably have all done something similar to that, at least once in our lives. And truth is, I feel guilty when I don't live up to what I have committed to do. It's just a vicious cycle, a downward spiral into self-humiliation. But it doesn't have to be that way. Clearly, the prophet who wrote this passage in what should be really second Isaiah certainly does not think so. Do not remember the former things or consider the things of old. I'm about to do a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? Do you not see it? That's what he's asking or she. Then just to make sure no one misses the point, some very poetic color is added to this. I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. A road through the wilderness, really? Rivers coursing through the desert? How can that be? When I was working on my PowerPoint, it is almost impossible to find a picture of a river in the desert. <laughs> they just really don't exist. These verses, of course, belong to Second Isaiah, the middle portion of this great prophetic book that is addressed to people who are living in Babylonian exile. I hope you understand that Isaiah really should be divided into three parts. First Isaiah is prior to the exile. Second Isaiah is people in the exile. Third Isaiah, guess what? They are back home. They are back in the promised land. But in this situation, the people have already been there for a full generation or more. The younger ones probably have no memory whatsoever of their former homes, other than wistful tales told to them by their sad-eyed parents. Judah is rapidly a disappearing dream. Responding to the guilt and despair, Isaiah weaves this powerful poetic vision. 
as he pictures the exiles marching triumphantly home along that broad new wilderness road, pausing now and then to quench their thirst in this swift, clear flowing river in the desert. And they will know who it is who cares for them, provides for them, and has declared that they will be captives no more. How small-minded are we to imagine that we disciples, and by that I don't mean necessarily members of the Christian church, disciples of Christ, I mean disciples of Jesus, those people studying, living his life. How small-minded it is to imagine that we are ever broken beyond repair. We serve the wilderness road builder, the river wrangler, the desert gardener after all. There is still a way ahead for us if we are so bold to take that first step. If we move ahead in the, the lectionary to the epistle reading for today, it is one of, my, one of my many favorite passages of scripture in the whole Bible. It's Philippians 3. Paul speaks with stunning honesty about his own pitfalls, about his own spiritual life and how he overcame terrible things. On the surface, Paul's life, or should we say Saul's life to begin with, looked pretty good. Paul writes about it in the first few verses of this chapter. In chapter three, Paul writes, beware of the dogs, beware of the evil workers, beware of those who mutilate the flesh, for it is we who are of circumcision, who worship in the spirit of God and boast in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh, even though I too have reason for confidence in the flesh. If anyone has a reason to be confident in the flesh, Paul writes, it's me, it's me. Circumcised on the eighth day, he lays out his pedigree. Listen carefully to who Paul was as Saul, okay? Circumcised on the eighth day, a member of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born among Hebrews. As to the law, a Pharisee. As to zeal, a persecutor of the church. As to righteousness under the law, blameless, perfect. Yet whatever gains I had, these I have come to regard as loss all because of Christ. More than that, I regard everything as lost because of the surpassing value knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and I regard them as rubbish. Remember that word, I'll get to that in a minute. In order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but one that comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God based on faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection, Paul writes, and to share in his sufferings by becoming like him in his death, if somehow I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Saul thought he had it made spiritually. He had done everything right. He played by all the rules. But deep inside, Saul knew something was missing and he felt spiritually dead. His frustrations began to swell inside of him so much that his focus turned outward on that new set called Christians. Saul traveled up and down the length of the land, hunting down Christians and turning them over to the authorities to be killed. We could think of Saul as a Jewish version of the Taliban and his dedication to per persecuting these Christians. His fanaticism garnered the respect of his fellow militants, and this did not make him happy. On the contrary, the more he saw Christians and their simple, joyful lives, even when faced with certain death, he began to wonder what it was that he was missing. In the book of Acts, we read the story of how Saul stood by presiding over the stoning of Stephen, the first known martyr of this new movement called the way. In short, Saul was not a very nice person. In Acts 9, we read that he was breathing threats and murders against the disciples of the Lord. It's vivid language and Saul is living 
out his anger, bitter thoughts, breathing them in, breathing them out again. And with each bitter breath, he became a little less human. And finally, it came to a head on a dusty road leading to the city of Damascus. All of a sudden, a voice breaks the silence, and Saul hears his name. Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Now put yourself in Saul's shoes. You're walking along on a peaceful road thinking about how many Christians you're going to be able to put to death in Damascus. And all of a sudden, the very person that you are persecuting, the person you know for sure is dead, speaks to you, calls you by name. Saul, Saul. Fast forward a few years and we are introduced to Paul. A complete remake of Saul. And it is in Philippians 3 where Paul reveals not only to the church in Philippi, but to you and me today, the secret to his success. Like I said, Paul lays out his, his pedigree, circumcised on the eighth day, that was a must. A member of the tribe of Israel, the people of Israel from the tribe of Benjamin. He knew his family origin. A Hebrew born among Hebrews as to the law of Pharisee. They were the ones who walked around bragging about how much they obeyed Torah. As to zeal, a persecutor of the church. As to righteousness under the law, blameless. That was Saul. And yet, all this time, he came to regard all of this as nothing. But Paul takes it a step further. I regret them all as rubbish. Now, some of you have heard me say this before, but the translators of the scriptures clean up what Paul actually wrote. The Greek word that is translated cleanly here as rubbish is the Greek word skubalon. Literally translated, it means human or animal excrement. That's what Paul thought of his past compared to his present and his future. And then Paul gives us the secret he has found. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. He goes on to write, Beloved, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but this one thing I do. Listen closely to what Paul says, because here's his secret. Forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead I press on toward the goal for the price of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus. Did you hear that? Forgetting the past, all our past failures, and believe me, I have more than my share of them, and pressing forward toward our goal of a life lived in Christ. That's what Paul tells us we need to do. But that pull from the past is so strong it's so difficult to get away from. So many times our past can be our worst enemy. Things we would rather not remember. Terrible things, painful things just seem to pop up out of nowhere. In a book called Out of the Blue, a story about the famous baseball pitcher Oral Hershiser. He shares his secret to success, spending most of his career as a pitcher for the L.A. Dodgers. The book reads that he had the unusual ability that every single time when he was getting ready to pitch, he would walk down off the pitcher's mound, get the ball back from the catcher, and as he walked up that little incline, he put everything in the past behind him, and all he was thinking about was that next pitch. He didn't think about the pitch he threw before that somebody may have hit out of the ballpark. Or he didn't think about a bad call that an umpire makes, not that umpires ever make bad calls. <laughs> Somehow, he was able to put all those distractions behind him, and the only thing on his mind was the next pitch I'm going to throw. That was it. And he became very successful in a similar way. We would do well to give our full attention to each day as it comes. Yesterday is over and done with, and we are not guaranteed tomorrow. If we could just 
direct all our energy on today without letting the past bother us? How would our lives be different? The second thing that we must do is to overcome the inertia or the apathy or inaction of the present. It's a familiar image to the sports-loving Greek and Roman audiences of Paul's writings. The image of a foot race, pushing on toward that final goal, that finish line. Believe it or not, there's actually a theological word for inertia, and it is one of the seven deadly sins. That word is slothful, or just plain lazy. Growing up, a very close friend of my sister's boyfriend had a nickname. I don't ever know that I knew his real name. But his nickname was Lucite. Do any of you remember when DuPont came out with paint called Lucite? And it was the first exterior grade paint that you didn't have to use mineral spirits or paint thinner to clean up. He could clean it up with water. And they called it the work skipper. <laughs> and so this young man gained the name Lucite. Because <laughs> he was a work skipper. <laughs> That's a true story. In fact, I called my daughter last night to ask if, they, if she would, he was still married to my sister's best friend, and she said, Lucite? And I said, yeah, and she said, I don't know. But she didn't know his name either. She <laughs> simply knew Lucite. That was it. It stuck. No matter how mature we may be as Christians, we cannot become lazy, complacent at all in our faith's journey. Remember what David Jeremiah said not too long ago, if you ain't dead, you ain't done. The final part of our spiritual journey is to listen to the call of the future. Having cast aside past mistakes and broken free from the inertia of the present, the challenge is to open our hearts to the voice of God calling us into God's future, not ours, God's future. There's a true story about a German POW camp filled with American prisoners, and somehow they came up with enough pieces of metal and wire and other things to make a radio, a makeshift radio and they were able to tune it to the BBC. One night they learned that the war in Europe was over. The German high command had surrendered, but that news had not made it down to the POW camp. However, the next morning, the guards noticed a drastic change in the prisoners there. They were happy and singing and waving at the guards. They laughed at the German shepherd guard dogs and stopped making fun of the terrible meals that they had to eat. Finally, four days later, when they woke up, they woke up to find that the Germans had deserted the camp, leaving the front gates wide open. They were free. Their captivity had come to an end, a long-awaited end. Their lives had been much different in the last three days because they knew something good was about to happen to them. In closing this morning, we too have a promise of a future event that will set us free. It is the promise that God isn't finished with us yet. We are just two short weeks away from Easter and the empty tomb that gives us the promise of a future in heaven with God and with the Christ child of Christmas. Because we have heard that promise and through faith we believe that promise, that we can get up from where we are, the place where we may oftentimes feel stuck, mired down, we can get up and move on to the eye of faith that is always a new day and God is always doing something new. Just like the author of our, our Isaiah passage for today promised. Have you perceived it? If you hadn't, why not? It flows like a river in the desert and it is there for you. All you have to do is get out of the past, get up and do something. It is always a new day with God. May it be so. Would you pray with me? Gracious God, help us to take each day as a new day to look for that stream that flows in the desert, knowing that you're the one that put it there. Amen.
We prepare ourselves for communion by singing together, remembering that everyone is invited here to God's table. <laughs> on this table represent love, represent the gift of ourselves to God, which we have given freely and lovingly. Now we receive the gift of God's love for us, the bread representing Jesus' body broken for us, and the cup representing the blood he shed for us. All who believe are welcome at this table of love. Heavenly Father, thank you for your Son, our Jesus. Thank you for life. Thank you for the promise of ever, everlasting life. Thank you for the beautiful people here at Countryside that care and love each other. It's in your Son's name we pray. Amen. We are the Christian Church, Disciples of Christ, a movement for wholeness in a fragmented world. As part of the one body of Christ, all are welcome at the Lord's table as God has welcomed us. For it was on that night so long ago when Jesus gave himself up for you, for me. He took bread, he blessed it, he broke it. He said, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After the meal, he took the cup the third cup, the cup of redemption. He said, this is the cup of the new covenant, my blood poured out just for you. Drink from it, all of you, for as often as we eat this bread and we drink this cup, we proclaim his death until he comes once again.
Would you join me in our prayer of dedication? Almighty God, we thank you for feeding us with the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him we offer to you our souls and bodies to be a living sacrifice. You may be here this morning seeking a new church home, or you may be here having never accepted Christ as your Savior. I would invite you to come as we stand and sing our hymn of dedication. Let us now depart in thy peace, page 444. We'll sing verse number one. Personally, I think it's very nice that the disciples' women plan to have their meeting on my birthday. Um, and that my birthday this year is also the first day of the Masters. What could be better, right? So, um, in leaving you with a smile on your face, did you know? This is a did you know question. Did you know that people who eat escargot don't like fast food? That's what, well, yeah, Trudy just said that assumes everybody knows what escargot is. That's snails, if you don't know, right? So anyway, let's close in prayer. Gracious God, we do thank you for this day that you have given us to look at these two wonderful passages of Scripture. Help us to understand that people in exile were concerned and worried about their future. And then Paul takes his past and shows us what can happen when we forget the past and move on in your future. Help us to do just that. Watch over us now as we part and go our separate ways. Keep us safe above all this week. Help each one of us to truly live our lives so that other people would see you in us. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.